Roguelike and roguelite are terms you might have heard over the last couple years, and likely you've been hearing about them a lot more often. The Binding of Isaac, Enter the Gungeon, Slay the Spire, NetHack, Dead Cells, Spelunky, FDL, Hades, Rogue Legacy, Caves of Cut, and so many more are some of the most common roguelikes and roguelites on the market right now, and there are dozens if not hundreds more that come out every year. But what's the difference between the two, and why does it matter to distinguish between them? So what's in a name? First off, let's talk about why this distinction is even necessary. This is probably a topic for another video entirely, but we'll touch on it here for a bit. To be honest, it's largely just shorthand. When I say first person shooter, real time strategy, visual novel, you get a pretty general idea of what I'm talking about. When I say old school doom like FPS, you get a better idea. Unfortunately for the roguelike genre, we never came up with a better umbrella term. So roguelike has to pull double duty here. I'd love to see someone come up with a better name for the overall genre, but since I've been racking my brain for a better term for the better part of the last decade, I'm keeping my expectations rather low in this regard. I have heard the term procedural death labyrinth thrown around once or twice, but it's not a great shorthand, and honestly it evokes a very specific mental image, which should be avoided when it comes to clear language and genres. Just to drive this point home, I'm going to list off a couple of genre combos for real games, but I won't say the name. Post your answers to the comments section if you think you know what they all are. Hardcore, Platformer, Metroidvania, Roguelite. Sci-Fi Horror, Third Person Shooter. Dating Sim Dungeon Crawler. Fantasy Sports Visual Novel. Esoteric Chemistry Simulator. Sentai Tactical Role Playing Game. Action Platformer, Cooking Simulator. Hopefully you knew at least a couple of those, if not all of them, and if not, you should at least have a fairly good idea of what kind of game each of those combinations could be. And that's why proper nomenclature for genres is so important, especially since there are so many games on the market that having a clear shorthand description of a game makes it a lot easier to explain to other people, or just to find after the fact. Plus, humans are wired to put things in boxes, and having a neat and tidy organizational system really does please our backwards monkey brains. So, what is Rogue? Well, the genre first started, unsurprisingly, with a simple game from 1980 named Rogue, exploring the Dungeons of Doom, though everyone knows of it and remembers it as just Rogue. Technically, there are a few other predecessors, such as Beneath Apple Manor, but none of them ever really caught on the same way that Rogue did. It was a pretty tough ASCII, uh, which is a game that uses text in lieu of actual graphics, dungeon crawler, that did things a bit different from all the rest. Namely, it combined procedural generation with permadeath, which no one had really done before in such a successful and popular manner. And man, was it popular. Computer nerds absolutely loved the game and went to town creating their own offshoots of Rogue, or even their own unique versions with entirely new code. This myriad of developers took a fairly laissez-faire approach to version control, and the genre started to spiral out of control wildly from there. Most notably at the time were Hack, Moria, ADOM, Adam, and Angband. Those were the first major roguelikes. But if you look at modern roguelikes, most of them barely even resemble Rogue, let alone any of the early roguelikes, with the exception of a handful of the more niche titles such as Tales of Majael, which is actually a distant offshoot of Angband, Caves of Cud, Dungeon Mance, and Adam, which has a top tier modernized version on Steam. There are tons more, but I'd rather keep them all for a tier list video later on. So I propose that we call these traditional roguelikes, as it's a fairly tidy descriptor and implies a deserved level of venerability. First, let's distill Rogue down into its component parts. Well, I say let's, but a group of roguelike developers already got together back in 2008 to do just that and came up with what's called the Berlin Interpretation which is a form of rubric for judging whether a game is a proper roguelike or not. To summarize, a proper roguelike should include, or be, randomly generated, have permadeath, be complex, be turn-based, grid-based, have resource management, be hack and slash, have exploration and discovery, and be non-modal, which I had to look this up, but it means no shop interfaces, no overworld maps, no instance battles, and etc. And that all action should be available at all times. And less importantly, it should also have a single player character, 
have monsters that are similar to players, which means they can also have inventories, their own spells, items, and etc. Be tactically challenging. Have an ASCII display. Have dungeons. I mean, it's, it's roguelike. You go into a dungeon. It's a dungeon crawler. And have numbers. So if you want to see exactly how much damage you do. If you want to see how much HP you have. Having that information readily available to the player so they can figure out and master it as best as possible. I'll leave a link in the description below to a couple of resources that go into depth on this rubric, but since I'm largely ignoring its contents, that's as far as I'll go. Because honestly, only the first three core components I listed really matter. Procedural generation, permadeath, and complexity. Every other element could be removed, and by modern standards, the game would still feel like a roguelike. So we'll leave the Berlin interpretation to the traditionalists and focus on those three core components instead. So now that we've tossed out the Berlin interpretation, let's talk about what's left. First and foremost, procedural generation, which is arguably the most important component, as that's what keeps players coming back for more time and time again. Ideally, there should be substantial enough variety built into a roguelike to allow players to play for potentially hundreds of unique runs and still find new secrets and surprises from time to time. Ideally, this should also include level design, player power-ups, and to a lesser degree, what challenges they face at different points throughout the game. Second, permadeath. When you die in a roguelike, that's it. You're back to square one, unless you picked up a one-up power-up somewhere along the way. This gamification of defeat is crucial for two reasons. One, it raises the stakes and makes every run feel like a challenge, and two, Without permadeath, there is less of an impetus for a second run, which would render the procedural generation near meaningless. In most games, death just kicks you back to the last save, checkpoint, bonfire, etc. But in roguelikes, death has a purpose. And surprisingly, it usually doesn't feel like a punishment or a waste of time. It just raises the stakes that much more. This also makes players focus harder on both mastering the game and their own skills while they play. Without either, most roguelikes are virtually impossible, but with constant practice and development, they get easier and easier. And finally, complexity, which really is more of a qualifier than an actual component, but it is necessary if you want to draw the line between a roguelike and an arcade game, which often feature the first two components, but in a shorter, more bite-sized manner. The easiest example of this division I can give is Asteroids, which is far too simple to really be called a roguelike. Whereas Nova Drift, which follows a lot of the same mechanics and conventions, absolutely qualifies as a proper modern roguelike. The same can be seen in Demon Crawl, which is a fantastic roguelike based entirely upon Minesweeper, but with deeper mechanics and some really neat twists. I use these examples specifically because they highlight just how versatile the roguelike genre is, as developers can combine these three core components in almost any game, genre, or idea to create something entirely new and interesting. In that case, what's a roguelite? In a more broad sense, a roguelite is anything that diverges from the three core components in some way. The original source of the term was from Cellar Door Games, the developers of Rogue Legacy, as a means of sidestepping the common criticisms thrown at roguelites for not being traditional enough. It worked surprisingly well, and this led to a branch of new roguelites that followed their lead. Namely, with the inclusion of meta-progression, which is some form of progression that carries over from one run to the next. In Rogue Legacy's case, it was permanent stat upgrades, character unlocks, equipment, and even a few fast travel points to traverse the world faster. This allowed them to balance Rogue Legacy around acquiring resources the player would spend after every death, and allowing them to clear just a bit more of the castle with every subsequent run until they beat the final boss, and thus the game. Unless they decide to play New Game Plus, and then Plus Plus, and then Plus Plus Plus. It goes on forever. The other form of popular roguelite are games that aren't strictly designed around either permadeath or procedural generation, but include them as either an auxiliary mode within the game, or as a means of adding variety, or upping the stakes in some way. Prey Mooncrash is a decent example of the first, which is a pretty dang good DLC spin-off of Prey, but with very light procedural generation, permadeath, and a meta progression system that let players carry over upgrades and a couple of items from run to run. Or Erratus Lord of the Dead, which simply does not include nearly enough procedural generation to really qualify as a proper roguelike, and also includes the ability to turn off permadeath entirely by allowing players to save and load their game whenever they please thus bypassing any real consequence for failure.
The best possible example I can give for the differences between roguelikes and roguelites is a game called Undermine, which originally followed in Rogue Legacy's footsteps with heavy meta progression in the form of upgradable items between runs that increased a wide variety of stats. This shifted the core focus of the game away from mastering the mechanics and working towards beating the final boss and more towards accruing as much wealth as possible for as many upgrades as possible. But midway through, Thorium Entertainment added the Other Mine game mode, which did away with meta progression entirely, mixed up the dungeons so players could encounter different biomes at random times instead of at fixed levels, and enforced permadeath so players would have to start from scratch every single time they died. Thus, this allowed players to toggle between a roguelite and a roguelike mode in a much more substantial way than I've seen in any other game. There are definitely a large number of games that straddle this division between roguelikes and roguelites, and to some degree, it's completely fine that there is often no clear division between the two. By nature, the genres should have extremely similar gameplay and features, and as I said in the beginning of the video, the distinction is largely for convenient shorthand when describing both types of games. I'm not interested in arbitrary gatekeeping of the genre anyway, and while there was a pretty aggressive effort to do so by hardcore roguelike fans and developers over the past decade or so, it never really seemed to work out. Better to just embrace the variety anyway, I say. Alright, before we go, I do have a couple of caveats. First and foremost, what about unlock systems? This is a bit of a judgement call, but for me, unlock systems don't necessarily make a roguelike into a roguelite. True, they are a form of meta progression, but unlocks rarely if ever change the overall difficulty curve of a roguelike in a substantive way, and generally just add more variety with every subsequent run. What about Iron Man runs, or Nuzlocks? Adding permadeath does not make a game into a roguelike, and while both Iron Man runs and or Nuzlocks do have roguelike elements, there rarely is enough substantive procedural generation to go the rest of the way in making a non-roguelike into one. It gets close, and it evokes the same feelings at times, but ultimately falls short in my opinion. And that's it. Sorta. The roguelike genre is ever-changing, and there's a very reasonable chance that the genre will look completely different in 10 years or so. Heck! We even have new subgenres and implementations popping up constantly. Slay the Spire is a great example, which was the first to popularize deck building with roguelike mechanics, and has spawned a massive number of clones, derivations, and copycats. The vast majority of modern roguelikes are made by indie devs too, so who knows what will happen if and when a AAA company decides to take a crack at making a roguelike. There have been a few minor forays such as Chalice Dungeons and Bloodborne, Prey Mooncrash, or Remnant from the Ashes survival mode. But to date, we haven't really seen a big studio make a game in this space before. And if they do, will it be good? Who knows? But that uncertainty is exciting all the same. Anyway, I hope this video was helpful for those of you who haven't really learned the differences within the roguelike genre, or was at least interesting for those of you who already knew. I absolutely adore roguelikes and roguelites of all kinds, so it was fun to finally organize my thoughts on them in this format. While you wait for me to put together my next Wanderlog, feel free to join my Discord over at discord.com slash invite slash wanderbots and get involved in the community. I often workshop ideas like this video essay over there first, and I'm always open to new potential topics to ramble about. Otherwise, if you like this video, leave me a like, hit subscribe, or tell your friends that it exists. I'd love to do more of these, and your support means all the difference. Speaking of, thanks to all my patrons and YouTube members for making this possible. And at last, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.